Okay, we are good to go. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are located around the world. For those who don't know me, my name is Sabrina. I work on the MuleSoft community team. I am covering for our online English uh, meetup leaders this week. And I'm very excited to welcome Sarah and Vijayan from our product marketing and product management teams. They have a very exciting three-part B2B crash course series. And today kicks off the first event in that series. And you have the wonderful Vijayan at your service uh, to answer any and all questions you have. A little bit of housekeeping. I have opened now the Q&A tab. Um, please ask any and all questions you have for our wonderful presenters in this tab. You can see it on the bottom of your screen in the right-hand corner. Uh, this is just because it'll be easy for us to ensure we keep track of all of the questions, especially if the chat uh, gets busy uh, with you all and putting any ideas or thoughts you might have. Uh, with that, I am going to shut myself off. I am here in the background and I want to hand it over to our wonderful presenters, Sarah and Vijayan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, depending where you are. Maybe good evening to some of you. Thank you for being here today. And class is in session. As Sabrina said, this is a three-part B2B crash course series that we are putting together for you all. And we're excited to have you here. We're going to be doing these meetups um, throughout the spring season. We're going to talk more about what the other classes are going to be a bit later. But today we have a PM Insider Lecture to kick us off where uh, Vijayan is going to, of course, do an overview of our AnyPoint Partner Manager. But he's got some exciting things to share, uh, which includes a demo. And uh, we're going to do an Ask Me Anything session for Vijayan. Not for me, for Vijayan. You can't ask me anything. You can ask Vijayan anything. Um, now, if you attend all three, we will be uh, taking like a class photo or sharing a class photo for our, our star attendees on our socials. So if you're here today, great. Be sure to check out part two and part three. More on that later. Um, as you just saw, Sabrina, our fearless community leader, and myself have the pleasure of hosting this session. Uh, but our main PM lecturer for today is, of course, Vijayan, um, who is our product leader specializing in B2B integration and EDI. Um, and actually, Vijayan's a little bit under the weather, but he is here, hell or high water, uh, to be here with you all. So thank you so much, Vijayan. I know you're feeling a little bit sick, but we okay. are so lucky to have you here today. Thank you. Um, for everyone, reminder before we get started that we will be possibly men mentioning some upcoming releases that are forward looking. Uh, so please remember to make any of your purchasing or investment decisions based on products that are currently available. Um, again, I already uh, have let you know that this is going to be all about any point partner manager, how businesses are revolutionizing how they're connecting across their partner ecosystem. We're going to talk about that. Vijayan will give a high level product overview in case you missed it in our last meetup sessions that we've been doing for you all. Uh, he'll also have a demo on one of our recent releases, and then we'll pivot to that AMA session that everyone is looking forward to. So I'm just going to go ahead and pass it to Vijayan now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Sabrina, can you make me the presenter? I, I, I'll, uh, because it's going to be, thank you. Oops. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm, I'm the PM for uh, our AnyPoint Partner Manager and B2B integrations in general at MuleSoft. So starting off with um, some statistics, right? And, and uh, oftentimes, when I when when I talk to people, people think that EDI is something that is it, it is of course it's a dated technology. It, it came in like kind of three four decades back, but it's not irrelevant. Still, like it, it's still uh, the workhorse for uh, all B two B transaction exchange and courtesy to Digital Commerce three hundred and sixty who publish yearly report on B two B commerce uh, sales, which includes EDI, which includes B two B commerce portals and other di different channels through which businesses send orders to other businesses more in in terms of um, digital or electronic uh, b2b sales and as you can see here from the statistics um, 
EDI still accounts for close to 75% of all electronic sales, right? Even when there are newer channels uh, that are emerging. So EDI continues to grow in terms of the total sales. And also after a bit of a couple of years of lull period when uh, the buying selling behavior in the B2B world changed due to COVID, as things become normal, uh, we can see that in, in 2023, the growth for EDI actually picked up uh, more steam after um, uh, some one digit uh, growth in the previous years. So just to kind of ground us on uh, the fact that EDA is still relevant and organizations are more and more looking to streamline and modernize how they do EDI, right? That, that is where we see uh, a lot of organizations across industries looking to see how they can process all B2B, B2B digital orders in one single platform, right? You don't want to process EDI orders in one platform and your uh, B2B commerce portal orders in a different platform. So the consolidation and rationalization of the platform so that uh, the, the people that are supporting and servicing these B2B orders have one single place to look at anything and everything, right? Instead of uh, scrambling through different uh, integration platforms and different systems and pointing fingers at each other. Uh, so that's kind of uh, just wanted to share some interesting um, uh, statistics that were that was re recently released. So moving on, I, I think we're not going to be spending too much time in kind of introducing Porter Major. I think at this point, most of uh, the people in, in, in this um, uh, session already know what is B2B integrations. So just to kind of um, uh, set some uh, context. So we all know what is Composable Enterprise Application Network. If you're a... If you are in the MuleSoft community, this is something that you are kind of talking about day in and day out in your day-to-day -day jobs, right? How the powerful unified integration platform in MuleSoft enables organizations to bring internal systems and applications like your CRMs, like Salesforce, or your ERPs like SAP, or your HR systems like Workday, or um, in any system for that matter, if every organization has hundreds of different applications. So MuleSoft has been all about how we bring all of these systems and applications and data sources together uh, using um, an API-led connectivity approach. But then uh, each of these organizations, like whether you are a retailer or a consumer goods company or a manufacturing company, or even high tech or pharmaceutical companies, they all have the need to integrate with external business partner ecosystem and they, they are, they're in a business to get those orders coming in right and, and get those payments going through that is the the fundamental uh, reason why most businesses exist so which requires your internal application landscape to be connected with your business partner ecosystem so any point partner manager is basically you can think of it as a gateway that uh, bridges your application network which comprises of all of your apis and all these uh, building blocks that connect and talk to your backend systems and Porter manager is going to be uh, your uh, solution that basically bridges uh, your existing investments in the integration space with uh, your trading partner ecosystem to uh, get those orders in execute those orders send those invoices and get paid or if you're a retailer you have to send outbound orders and get inbound invoices um, so it's regardless of which what what is your um, ultimate business or industry there is always a need for integrating with external business partner ecosystem so fundamentally partner manager helps organizations to speed up or accelerate partner onboarding and we're going to be seeing a live demo of um, how we are able to onboard a partner and uh, implement an end-to-end -end, um, order to cash workflow today in the session and uh, how we are able to connect to the process and system APIs because you are able to connect to anything and everything from the AnyPoint platform. So Partner Manager can talk to your um, uh, API thrall within your enterprise to connect to any system internally or externally. And, and last but not the least, uh, you also your business users need to have insights and visibility into those transactions coming in and going out. So we'll um, kind of uh, take a look at how Partner Manager facilitates uh, those things through uh, out of the box uh, capabilities. Um, before we get into the actual demonstration, so just um, uh, a technical overview of uh, where Partner Manager stands. And uh, if you've been following Partner Manager for the past um, uh, several months, we have been uh, releasing a lot of innovations and new features into the product uh, to add additional data formats, to add additional operational management capabilities like transaction replay, 
uh, not just through UI, but also through API calls. So this is kind of where the product stands as, as of today uh, in terms of the message formats that are supported, which includes extra Edifact and Pod Manager is not married only to EDI, right? And there are organizations that want to exchange XMLs and JSONs and CSVs too. So you can use Pod Manager in, uh, to exchange message formats of any of these types through any of these listed protocols, right? So there are, we do have customers, some customers that use partner manager to process 100% non-EDA transactions as well. So um, as, as your trading partner requirements come through, so you're able to uh, find a value in using partner manager uh, from a B2B integration standpoint. Moving on um, before the demonstration, just a recap of uh, some of the features that we delivered in the past uh, few months. Uh, starting off with uh, support for CSV and delimited file formats. As I said, there are uh, certain geographies and in certain industries where customers, while EDA is still uh, the dominant force, as we saw in the first slide with the statistics, there are still organizations using CSV-based transactions, right? So, and you are able to do that now in Porto Manager uh, following a very consistent low-code experience and configuring those types of flows. And transaction replay was one of the uh, most important uh, innovation that we released uh, last year, where when things fail, when 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 there are orders and invoices failing, you don't want to be uh, picking the phone and calling your backend teams or your business partners to resend those. So you're able to do that uh, from the UI with a click of a button or also through an APA call. So we added support for RTF uh, to deploy into um, Amazon EKS uh, clusters. And also very recently, we added support for um, uh, configuring SFTP endpoints with uh, SSH identity key, which is a very common um, uh, uh, requirement um, in when customers use SFTP as the transfer protocol. Coming soon, uh, we are working on some interesting stuff uh, that will come uh, in the next uh, few months, starting off with um, uh, ready to deploy pre-built accelerator for integrating Partner Manager and MuleSoft with Salesforce Order Management System. What this means is this will uh, provide customers with uh, pre-built mappings for EDI to uh, Salesforce order objects and uh, deploying those process and system APIs. You, you basically are already 80, 90% of your way to integrate EDI transactions into Salesforce order management system, uh, which basically enables organizations to take advantage of, of the um, broader customer 360 platform within Salesforce to better service uh, your B2B customers across all digital channels. And we are also going to be um, uh, making some important um, innovations uh, around how the maps are used. So today you have to import the, the transformation maps inside of each message flow. Uh, this change that we are working on is going to be uh, allowing you to configure maps as a configuration like endpoints and message types and reference those maps inside of uh, message flows. So what that means is when you have to update a map that is used in hundreds of flows, you can get it done like with, with just um, a couple of uh, steps versus going through an update process across all of your message flows. Later this year, we'll also be uh, adding support for deploying Porter Manager runtime applications into Cloud Up 2. That's another uh, key milestone that we are working uh, for this year. So that um, kind of covers the introduction and uh, what we have done and what we are working on. So we are going to be looking at a, a very kind of a comprehensive demo demonstration of, uh, of uh, some of the new features that we released in Porter Manager recently, uh, which will be uh, how you can configure SFTP endpoints with uh, SSH identity keys. So what we are, for this demonstration, uh, I'm going to be representing uh, a fictional organization called Mythical Supplies, and they are going to onboard another fictional uh, retailer called NextGen uh, Gadgets, who are going to be sending in EDI purchase orders to Mythical Supplies, and Mythical Supplies is going to create those orders in their backend system, which is SAP, and then executes that order to confirm the order, ship the order, and invoice uh, the order after the shipment. So uh, the demonstration is going to start uh, where I'm going to be dropping in uh, 
an EDI 850 purchase order file in an SFTP location. In real world, it's going to all happen automatically. There is not going to be any manual intervention. It's the, the backend ERP and B2B platform at NextGen will uh, drop these files automatically. And when I drop that file, I'm going to be configuring Partner Manager with um, NextGen as a trading partner. And I'm going to be configuring this folder, the SFTP folder, as an uh, inbound endpoint uh, to pick up the EDA files that are dropped in that folder. And when Partner Manager receives the transaction, the first step in any EDA message processing is to first validate if the incoming EDA transaction is syntactic is syntactically correct, right? So this is all driven by the uh, uh, schema and the specifications of the transaction itself. So if the data comes in with no line item, the PO comes in with no purchase order number. Uh, so those kind of validations are performed as the first step. So you don't have to write any code to do that. So it is all done and taken care of automatically. And Potter Manager basically sends a 997 or a functional acknowledgement back to the partner after that validation is performed. So this can either tell NextGen that the received 850 is valid and we are going to be crossing it further into the backend system, or it could also be, hey, um, uh, th there is something wrong in the data because it's missing some mandatory fields or it is uh, some, some length validations are violated. So that, that can be a negative acknowledgement also. If the 850 EDI transaction is deemed to be valid, then the message is further sent to the transformation uh, step. We have a data view transformation that is built to translate the 850 into a JSON. So we have published a number of uh, examples in any point exchange that has um, standard EDI mapping for both inbound and outbound use cases for extra artifact and, and even some XML um, uh, use cases from a B2B integration standpoint. So the transmission map gets applied and the 850 magically becomes a JSON, right? And gets sent to your uh, to the process API. And the process API does some additional orchestration and um, checks and it calls the SAP system API and then magically the sales order is created in SAP. Just for the demonstration purpose, we are uh, having this process API also after successfully creating the order in SAP. The, we are sending a message to a Slack channel informing the team that, hey, we just got an order from this company. And, and so that um, it, it's more of an information, but this can be, it, it could be overwhelming to send a notification for every order created because you could be getting thousands of orders every hour. Uh, this could also be a conditional based, right? If you received an order with items that are low in stock, or if you received an order with, uh, with an incorrect SKU, so the, the, it, it can be kind of some of those uh, things that you are able to do um, because uh, of the advantages that API-led connectivity approach offers. So then uh, as the order is created, so there are uh, the backend system takes care of all the inventory availability checks and whatnot. So when the uh, order or items are confirmed, so a purchase order acknowledgement message is um, sent back to partner manager. So it goes as an outbound 855 PO acknowledgement transaction and it updates, uh, it, it gets dropped in a, another SFTP folder here. And then the shipment and invoice transactions are also sent through from the supplier to the customer. And when, when some of these invoices or other transactions are sent, you can configure the message flow in partner manager to uh, set if you are expecting a functional acknowledgement back because if you are sending in a, an invoice worth $50,000, and you want to make sure that invoice is kind of received successfully by your uh, customer so that you will get uh, paid in a timely manner. So it's similar to how we request uh, signature confirmation when we ship out a package in UPS or FedEx, right? You, you want to make sure the item gets delivered. It's pretty much the same, and we are doing it um, in, in the context of uh, electronic uh, document delivery. So, as we go through this uh, demonstration, I think we have plenty of time to complete them all. Um, uh, we are going to be looking at how we configure SFTP endpoints with SSH key authentication, which is one of the uh, recent uh, features that we released. And we are also going to look at uh, some of the deployment processes and how the runtime applications uh, are updated. Uh, we don't deploy one new application for each of these endpoints, right? That, that's going to be an overkill. 
because a lot of organizations have hundreds and thousands of uh, trading partners and it doesn't make uh, sense to deploy individual applications. So uh, the applications that Partner Manager deploys are all very, very generic and dynamic. So whenever you add a new endpoint, we don't deploy a new application. We rather uh, redeploy an applic the existing application by injecting things like your uh, configurations or your um, SSH keys into the same application. So uh, it is a very configuration-driven development, and also the runtime execution is also very much uh, configuration-driven. Um, and we talked about acknowledgement, so I'm also going to kind of uh, talk through one of the uh, most important uh, feature of the box feature that Partner Manager offers um, around how uh, if you send an 810 out and you're getting a 997 back, the 997 could either say that the 810 invoice was accepted or rejected. And, and you need to know about it, right? If you sent in an 810 invoice with some uh, missing fields and your customer is rejecting it, what that means is you're not going to get paid on that invoice. And, and it is important that you um, uh, become aware of uh, such things. So the acknowledgement reconciliation process makes all of that possible without with, with just a single click of a checkbox. So, so that's what we are going to be looking at today. And I think we have maybe 30 minutes uh, to do all of this. So what I'm going to be uh, doing is I'm going to go straight into any point partner manager. Um, so maybe I'll start from the platform. So when you log into your any point platform, if you have your organization has entitlements and if you have permissions to access partner manager, you will see the uh, um, you'll see partner manager showing up under the management center. And right now I'm logged into the mythical three organization. So if your organization has multiple lines of business and you can run partner manager in each business group and in each environment. So there is partner manager is very much uh, part of the AnyPoint platform and it's, it's uh, organized uh, following the general AnyPoint platform architecture when it comes to business groups and environments. So I'm going into partner manager here. So for this um, demonstration, we already have, um, this is not a kind of a blank slate that we are starting. So this is an environment. So Mythical Supplies already has a number of uh, partners configured and they already have a number of message flows configured and deployed. So they're just adding or they just um, signed up a contract with uh, next gen gadgets and they want to onboard them. So all of these process API endpoints and some of these inbound um, endpoints for other protocols like AS2, they are all already deployed and working here. So uh, for this demonstration, so we are going to be getting in an 850 uh, EDA 850 transaction, which is already configured here. So I don't have to uh, reconfigure it again, like when I'm onboarding every new partner. So you, uh, we will be pretty much reusing all the configurations that are already created and uh, deployed. So all I have to do is because I already have the integration with the backend process APIs and partner is already connected to the system APIs for outbound acknowledgements and ASNs and invoices. So, so I'll be pretty much reusing a lot of those configurations that are already deployed. So what I'm going to do is um, like I'll quickly go here. So I do have kind of I've gotten the SSH key from uh, NextGen which we'll be using in our uh, configuration when we create the endpoints and the keys for this partner. So let's go to partners. So I need to create a new partner here. Uh, so I'll click create so you can create a partner or some of the partners use a third party connection like a VAN um, that manage the communication on behalf of multiple partners. So you have uh, the option to create such uh, entities also in the system. So here we are going to be uh, directly integrating with the next gen uh, gadgets. So I'll just click their name. Going to, they have shared their identifiers. So I'll just uh, use some of those information that was exchanged mutually between my organization and um, and uh, next gen gadgets. So I create an identifier for them, and the partner is created. So you can also call in an API to do this if you want to automate a lot of these processes. So anything and everything that you are able to do in the UI, you are also able to do it uh, through APA calls. So I have to create a couple more uh, identifiers for this customer. So there is an interchange identifier. This is GS is the group identifier for EDI X12. And I'm also going to create an, um, another um, 
uh, reference identifier for how Potter Manager will identify documents from outbound uh, transactions. And in addition, you can also kind of, um, if you want to add their logos, for instance, so you can put that so that you know, it's not a plain thing. You're able to do that and you're able to also add their contacts. So a lot of times you need to contact your business partners. So, so it's just, just selecting some random email and phone numbers so you are able to basically look at their profile and then this is just nothing to do with the functional aspects but more from a profile management standpoint so next and the most important thing is um, we know that this the integration between us and this partner is going to be through sftp with ssh key based authentication so first step here is to uh, configure the identity key so you can kind of name the identity key uh, however you want. So it's like so that you can easily remember when it was created and things of that nature. And here uh, you will be uploading the key. So I have the private key here. So I'm uploading it. I hope I remember the passphrase correctly. And uh, this expiration date is like identity keys generally don't have ex any expiration date, but Oftentimes, organizations uh, rotate keys every year or every couple of years. So if you have any uh, specific arrangements or agreements with your partner on when this key will likely be rotated, so you can manually override the expiration date, but otherwise we're just uh, randomly setting a 99 years expiry because of the fact that um, identity keys have no expiration date theoretically. So we are creating this key here. So when you create these keys, like these are securely stored in any point secrets manager. So they are not stored in any place in, inside of Potter Manager boundary. So we leverage uh, any point secrets manager as a secret vault to house all the sensitive information, including certificate keys, or even um, username passwords. They're all uh, stored in any point secrets manager. So the next step here is, um, uh, going to be, I need to create two endpoints, right? One to pick up file from this two mythical folder and one to pick up files from this from or drop files into this from mythical. So anything that next gen sends to mythical is going to be dropped here. Anything mythical sends back to next gen is going to be dropped here. So let me, so here you will be selecting. So I'm receiving something from a partner, right? You, since you are creating this endpoint from next gen gadgets you they are set as the owner you can also create some common endpoints in the post profile which will not have any partner uh, association so now the next step is to select um, the protocol so when you select sftp you can enter a description and you can uh, uh, put in the host the port is 22 and this is where you select like earlier we only supported username and password based authentication until the recent release but now you do have additional options that you can choose from. So for this partner, the agreement uh, between us uh, is to use a basic plus identity key as the authentication method. So my username is, uh, I hope I remember all of these correctly. Okay, so I typed in the username and password and the next step is to select the SSH uh, key. So we already created the SSH key, so I can sell, click select. If you forgot and you came directly into the uh, endpoint creation uh, uh, UI, you can create a new key from here too. So since it's already created, I'm just selecting this as the key and uh, that's already selected. So the source path is going to be actually, uh, when I log in, I'm actually expected to pick from uh, let's say this folder. So they may have different uh, folders for different environments and they may have a different host for different environments. So each organization has their own practices when it comes to whether they use the same server for all environments or different servers for production and others. So our expectation here is, um, so I need to pick up all the files coming from NextGen to Mythical from this folder. So I am selecting this, that as my path and you can uh, give a frequency at which you want to pick up the file. So the lowest you can do is 30 seconds so that 
you're not kind of creating too many endpoints with just one seconds and bombarding the system. Um, and you can also configure, you, you need to, if you're expecting an EDI message through this endpoint, you will need to select that. Uh, the reason for this is when we get EDI transactions, we are able to detect what format they are or what standard they are, whether it's X12 or Edifact, and uh, we're able to uh, identify the sender and the receiver identifiers of those transactions by parsing the data. But if you're receiving a XML, JSON, or CSV, we need a bit of guidance because they, the schemas and the structure is defined by each organization. So here, our um, we are picking up EDA files, and you can also configure file name patterns. So I'm picking anything that has the extension of EDI. So I created that. So this will get created in a moment. And the next thing I need to do is to configure a, an endpoint to send outbound transactions back to NextGen. So it's the same drill. So you'll be configuring your uh, host and username and password. Oops. And uh, you will select the same key. So that way, when you have to update or rotate the key, you're not kind of updating each endpoint. You can just update the key directly, and it'll. Um, there's a way in which you can apply the change to all the endpoints using that key. Uh, the next step here is I need to drop this uh, outbound transactions on this folder. So I'm going to be configuring that as my destination path. And oftentimes in the EDA world, Customers have different expectations when it comes to file naming convention. If you are building a Mule application and if you are uh, delivering a file using the standard SFTP connector, you are able to do a lot of things, right? You you can use you can build your own logic, but given that in Part Manager, the product itself controls all the logics that goes. So we are providing uh, means through which you can construct your file names uh, based on what your trading partner or your uh, backend applications uh, required. So here we are basically using some dynamic um, uh, uh, properties that will get overridden when transactions are processed in the runtime. So this file is going to be going with doc type. If it's an 855, it's going to be going with 855 underscore. Uh, or you can also put uh, something like a static prefix so that will not get replaced. So it's a very, there, there's a lot of flexibility in this and these are what the available options are documented in the uh, in the system. So I'm removing the group control number, I'm adding a prefix here, and this is the file name that I want uh, when, when any file is processed through the same point. So I'm clicking save. And um, so once we are done with that, so there are uh, ways in which you can control, apply different validation rules. And because I'm going to be probably testing this uh, to make sure everything is working. Uh, I don't want to uh, change the control numbers because in, in EDA transaction, there is something called control numbers uh, that has to be unique in each transaction so that there is no duplicate processing. But if you are testing with a static file to make sure your mapping and everything works, you don't want to change the control number every time you drop that file. So it's okay to turn it off in testing during testing phases. So what that means is if that is disabled, Part manager is not going to enforce duplicate checking. And on the outbound, you can configure a lot of things like um, oftentimes in the EDA world, customers have different preferences when it comes to segment terminators and whether you want to add a terminator at the end of each uh, segment. So here there is no line ending between segments, which basically means the EDA file will get generated with a single line. And I want to change that to um, uh, put a carriage return and line feed instead. So these are common things and you can control uh, on a partner by partner basis, or you can also have these configurations overridden in the individual message uh, type level in the message flows. So now this partner profile is already created. I'm going to go to message flow. So this is where you uh, get to create your uh, all of your um, the end to end logical flow of how the messages are processed. I'm going to be creating a receive from partner message flow, which will be the inbound 850 uh, flow. So I'll select the um, the partner as the partner that will be sending this transaction. So selecting it. 
and you are basically taken into a wizard where you have to make four simple choices. So there are, you need to select the receiving endpoint through which you are expecting the data to be coming in. So we already created this receive from next gen gadgets, which basically picks up the file from this uh, prod mythical folder every 30 seconds. This is the extension. So you can look at all those things and select it. And the next step here is what type of file that you're expecting. So we're expecting an X12 850 transaction. So you can search for 850, which because you already have this environment receiving 850 files from many other partners, so you don't have to recreate it. So I'm selecting it. You can also select create custom versions of, of those 850 schemas. Uh, that there are examples uh, out there in exchange uh, for those uh, scenarios. But here we are using a standard extra 4010850. So the next step is we want to return a functional acknowledgement. Right? This step is basically when we process an 850, we want to return a 997 functional acknowledgement. So to do that, you just need to select. So you can, this is optional. You can choose to do it or choose to skip it. So I want to do it. So selected it and I need to select the endpoint to which this 997 needs to be sent back to. So I'm selecting, so this is my endpoint to send this data back. So this is our file name pattern that we just configured and we are selecting that. And the next step is to import a data view transformation map. So in any point exchange, if you go to uh, and search for B2B and EDI, you will have a couple of uh, examples. Uh, go to the provider with Newsoft. So these examples have pre-built mappings for standard EDI and transactions like 850, 810. Um, so this experience of creating this map is if you're already familiar with DW, should be no brainer, should be able to easily map EDA transactions also. Uh, so the, it's the same skill set and the same concepts uh, and, and the connector and the data sense uh, makes it so easy to map EDA transactions in and out. So strongly recommend uh, maybe playing with these examples that'll uh, help you to understand how EDA mapping works in uh, data view. So I have that map already built. So I'm going to be uh, um, selecting that map. You basically build it in studio, go through the unit testing, and then bring it into Porter Manager when, when you have done all of the validations for, uh, for the testing. So next step is, uh, so this map is going to give me a JS translated JSON uh, uh, output. And that output is, um, uh, is, is going to be, uh, this is my message type for the target. And uh, the next step is to tell Porter Manager where to deliver this uh, data to. So we already have this process API that is connected to the SAP system API. So this is already used by 23 message flows. I'm just delivering this translated data into that same endpoint uh, that receives uh, the translated JSON message. So we are basically sending the translated JSON to this step. This calls the system APIs for SAP and Slack, and everything happens uh, uh, magically. So now this all of we have all green checks. So the next step is to deploy this message flow into the runtime. So as I said earlier, we don't deploy one application for each message flow or one application for each endpoint. So it is all very standardized and generic. So I'm going to go and click deploy. And inbound 850 from next So when this is done, so the request is sent to our deployment orchestration process in the cloud which analyzes the configurations available in this message flow. Basically, we have an endpoint called this. This is the first time a message flow using this endpoint is being deployed. And this is the first time a message flow using this endpoint is being deployed. And Porter Manager already knows that this message type and this endpoints are already used by other message flows for other partners. So it doesn't have to do anything about it. It's just going to take care of uh, updating our SFTP inbound and outbound applications in the runtime with the information of this new endpoints that are configured. So you will momentarily see in Runtime Manager uh, the um, 
SFTP inbound and outbound uh, application, these two applications getting redeployed as part of major pushes the configurations and the SSH keys for those endpoints into this application. Uh, we will give, uh, it, it, it would take about probably 10 minutes for this to complete. While it is working, I'm going to be kind of, uh, you see that the outbound SFTP app, app is now getting updated. So it's going to take close to eight, eight or even 10 minutes for both the applications to get deployed. So while it's working on that, those deployments, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be uh, creating my outbound 855 message flow. So the flow is the 850 goes and it goes to SAP, and then there's going to be a message from the process API uh, calling in part manager with the JSON purchase order acknowledgement that needs to be now translated back into 855 and sent to this folder. So uh, now we will be creating the send to partner message flow. And I'll select uh, the same partner for which we are, uh, that, that we are onboarding. So the uh, typical recommended uh, integration pattern between the backend and portal manager is always HTTP, right? You can also uh, pick up files from SFTP folders or FTP folders, but since it's all API-led implementation and um, almost always you will have a process API that is uh, sending in the signal for outbound transactions. So you don't have to create separate endpoints for that integration, for that touch point. Whether you are sending in a PO acknowledgement or invoice or shipment or load tenders or anything, you can get that all done with a single endpoint that is uh, receiving all outbound messages. And Power Manager has a built-in message uh, routing framework that can dynamically understand what type of data is being sent and how to route it. Right? You don't have to create different HTTP endpoints to process data to different partners or different uh, message types. So I'm selecting this as my endpoint. And the next step is to select what type of message I am getting. So if you see here, this endpoint is already deployed because we have so many other outbound transactions going from Power Manager. So this is running. So this is running on the shared load balancer, but you can also configure these endpoints to deploy the runtime applications into the into the HTTPS private port and use a dedicated load balancer to uh, route the traffic into the worker. But in this example, it's it's running on the SLB. So next step is to select what type of uh, message you're expecting from the backend. So I'm expecting a purchase order acknowledgement to be coming back. So it's we already have. 21 message flows using this message types. So I'm creating the 22nd, uh, click that. So you will see uh, this URL, like earlier we had a placeholder here in the relative path of this URL. But now when I selected this, this changed here. So your backend process API that is sending in a purchase order acknowledgement should actually post that JSON message to this URL. So this is a single application. So this is my base path. So there is one single runtime application running at this URL. And when that message comes into that application, we inspect the relative path, which is nothing but the message type. And that is how we are actually routing the transaction. So since we are getting a JSON message from the backend, you need to kind of, uh, if it's an external message or edifact message coming from the partner, we know where to get the sender and receiver ID from. But when you are processing a message where you define your schema and the specification, you need to guide partner manager on where in the payload to get the partner information from. So it's all done as part of the reference mapping that is attached to the message type definition. Not going to go too much into it uh, in the interest of time. So I'm configuring, so any outbound PO act going to any of the configured identifiers for this partner, I want to route it through this message flow. Or you can, some of your partners may have a UK business and a US business or can Canadian business, and you want to apply different uh, mapping or different identifiers, you can actually leverage this uh, functionality. So now I'm, if it, anything is going to this next gen as the identifier, um, I want to route that data through this message flow. So next step here is to select the 855, the JSON to 855 map, uh, we do have this as an example in the in the exchange asset that I was showing earlier. So you select that as your transmission map. So it basically takes the JSON purchase order acknowledgement and turns that into a 4010 855 PO acknowledgement. 
So the next step is to select uh, that you want to get your generating an 855 transaction. And you want, um, I don't want to necessarily get an acknowledgement for an 855. So this is again configurable. So if you want to get a functional acknowledgement, if you're expecting to get a functional acknowledgement, you can check that and you can also set when you want to be alarmed if you don't have uh, an acknowledgement back to the partner. It can be, let's say, two hours. I want to get, I'm expecting an announcement to be coming back from this partner every within two hours after sending an outbound transaction. And you also have to select how you're expecting that 997 to be coming back. So almost always your 997 also is going to be coming back through the same endpoint through which other EDA transactions are coming. Uh, so you will select that as the endpoint through which the acts are going to come back. The next step is to uh, select the identifiers. I'm just going to go a bit faster here in the interest of time. So you just have to select uh, the envelope uh, information for the uh, header segments called ISA, which stands for interchange start, and uh, GS, which stands for group start. And then now we have a 855 ready to go. So you will select the uh, endpoint to which you, are, you need to drop the 855. So it will be the same endpoint. So since we have configured the file name pattern to be dynamic, so when you drop in a 997, this will get replaced with 997. So in this example, it will get replaced with 855 and then later 856, 810. So this is all done dynamically. So, uh, so now this 855 message flow is also ready to be deployed. Let's go and check. Uh, so this flow is still being worked. So if I go back to Runtime Manager, so the outbound SFTP app just got deployed. So the next step is going to be updating the inbound SFTP app, which will take maybe another five minutes to complete. I'll, in the in the meantime, I'm going to be creating the uh, 856 and the 810 message flows as well. So the drill is the same. So I'm going to be uh, selecting the endpoint through which uh, I'm expecting the ASN message to be coming. As you can see here, I have just one endpoint that is standing between uh, the backend systems and bottom manager for outbound. So I'm selecting that. <coughs> Next step is I'm expecting an uh, ASN. So I already have the message flow, the message type configured. So I'm selecting this as the, and you will see that this message type getting replaced with port ASN here. So this data could be coming in from a different process API that handles all the shipment related aspects. But then, like you're again, like calling the same endpoint, but just with a different relative path based on the message types. So I'm going to be selecting the reference identifiers for these transactions. And the map to translate this uh, ASN JSON to uh, an X12 856 advanced ship notice transaction. And the next step is to select 856 as the, it's a 4010 856. So I'll select the appropriate one. And let's say, I, I don't want to expect, I don't expect a functional acknowledgement on the 856, so I can skip it at a message type level. So I'll pick up uh, all the different identifiers that I want uh, to set on the generated EDA transaction. And I want to send this also to the same endpoint which the 855 is sent to. And we have the inbound SFTP is being deployed, so it, it should complete in, in maybe a couple of minutes. So in the meantime, I'm going to be creating and uh, getting my 810 invoice message flow. And just so you know, Vijayan, we do have quite a bit of questions that sure. have come through as yeah. we move along. So um, I'm not sure if we want to tackle them throughout or um, 
you know, shift to that now, but do you want to give us a chance to answer? The sure. Question? Yeah, I you know. Uh, maybe can, can you read some of those questions? And, and I think I'm just doing the same thing that I did for the past two minutes. So I, I can. Sure. Yeah, I'll just, um, there's quite a bit. So I'll just start top to bottom here on the Q and A tab and um, yep. folks, you can jump in there if you have more. Um, but we have a question from Pranav. Does partner manager support AMQ or event based transactions? So partner manager as such is, is actually, I mean, this is the, this slide basically talks about what protocols are natively supported inside of partner manager. But then if you want to deliver a uh, translated JSON instead of uh, calling in a, an API to uh, another queue, you, you still will be calling an HTTP service, which can have different connectors, right? Whatever connector is available in, in any point platform, you can use it to deliver. So, but from what is supported out of the box uh, within Potter Manager, so it's limited to these protocols that you see in this uh, list. Okay, and that might be related to Kevin's question on what EDI message sets are supported. He gives examples of ERP, order to cache, 3PL, et cetera. Um, can, can you repeat that question, Sarah, please? What EDI message sets are supported? ERP, order to cache, 3PL, et cetera. Yeah, so, um, so anything like a, within the constructs of X12, so when you go into the message type, so this is how you create a new message type. Let's say select receive from partners. And uh, as we saw in the other slide, so these are the message formats that are supported. And when you select X12, there are plenty of different uh, versions and variations inside of uh, X12. So if you want to, let's say 5010, so you will select the version. And underneath the version, you will select message types like 850s, or if you're talking 3PLs like the 940s and 945s for barrel shipping, or 204, 990, 214 for transportation execution, pretty much. I mean, not pretty much. And pretty, we, we support all the message types that are available under X12 and Edifax standards. And in terms of ERPs, uh, you can, uh, we do have quite a bit of customers using Porter Manager where, um, the, where they uh, translate EDI transactions in and out to IDOCs using the standard XML capability. So you would process them as standard XML messages, but then uh, you, you are able to map to uh, the ERP formats too. Thanks, Vijayan. We have a question from Siddharth on, uh, it's a competitive question. Um, SAP has built it, built in functionality to support EDIs. What would you say is the differentiator with Partner Manager and adding value here? End of the day, Partner Manager is part of the AnyPoint platform, right? You're able to uh, connect to, like, if you, if you use different uh, virus management systems or if you have to talk to a different uh, TMS system outside of the kind of maybe the SAP ecosystem, AnyPoint Partner Manager or AnyPoint platform as such uh, has a lot of those things covered. Right, and, and, and especially non-SAP based integrations, if, you, if there are needs. And even uh, creating uh, the standard mappings between EDI and IDOCs, a lot of our customers were able to get it done like in, in a very short amount of time. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, we will see uh, in, in, in a moment, uh, there are a lot of uh, things, especially if you go to the activity screen here, you're able to see all the transactions and you are able to perform searches uh, of uh, different values. Uh, some of these things are able to be done in uh, other products, but then the way in which uh, we implement it, and you can also call an API to get the same information. We do have a number of customers leveraging our uh, tracking APIs to send the same information to uh, other BI tools like Tableau or uh, Power BI, or some of our customers are using Salesforce as a supply chain control tower. So the API, uh, led implementation and uh, being able to connect to any uh, other uh, backend systems. So there is there's a lot of um, a lot of benefits that uh, Fortimager offers uh, from a competitive standpoint. Great, thanks, Vijayan. Um, a question from Venkata Kishore: Is there are there any tools that exist to migrate the trading partners from legacy B two B tools like Sterling, OpenText B two B? to partner manager? 
we don't uh, provide uh, uh, anything out of the box, but uh, some of our SI partners do have offerings uh, to to convert B two B integration workflows from legacy platforms into into partner manager or into any point platform in general. So we can maybe get back with more specific responses based on the unique requirements that Make it me have, but but there are some partners that have uh, some accelerators that help in the migration. From Govind, are there any articles explaining how to customize the DW mapping sets, assets? Sorry, DW mapping assets. <laughs> yeah, so this is one example uh, in Exchange available in Exchange that uh, gives. Uh, let me actually read the deploy one of these message flows and uh, take that question. I know we have only a couple of minutes. I want to show at least one round trip transaction. So this, I mean, I'm just jumping here. So this 855 message flow, uh, because we are using the same endpoints that were already deployed into the runtime. So this shouldn't take kind of for uh, the 10 minutes that it took for the 850 message flow because we, are, we were introducing a new message uh, type there. So going back to uh, the question, so this is one example. So and uh, in the EDA uh, world, there are also a lot of uh, times customers don't strictly follow what X12 says, right? Some customers choose to change an optional data segment or element into mandatory or mandatory to optional, change the length limits. So in MuleSoft, we do have what we call as ESL or EDA schema language, which is more of a YAML based um, Kind of a representation of the EDA schema. So this example that you see here in Exchange, it basically shows how you can kind of override the length definition of a field like PO number. Like Excel says it has to be 22 characters. Uh, it was all defined when organizations were using mainframes where space is a real was a real, real constraint. So now customers are using more modern ERPs and order management systems who have which has no restriction. So if you and your partners are okay to increase the length limit of such fields, you can do that. So this would be <coughs> one example that, um, uh, that that can be a good starting point for such uh, uh, use cases. <coughs> I hope that answered uh, the question. So coming back here, so I just deployed, so it just, it, it took like maybe a few seconds to complete this deployment. So I'm going to be deploying the 856 and 810 also. And now we are at time. Uh, Sarah, how, how do you want to go from here? Um, should should yes. we, maybe since it's recorded, maybe I, I can take maybe another five minutes to wrap it up and people who, who has to drop can drop and watch the recording later, right? Sure. Um, Sabrina, is that all right with you if we, um... Yeah, these questions. Okay, that is great. I think what I was just uh, replying to you about all the questions we didn't get to. I think it would be great. I know folks probably mm -hmm. have to drop because it is at the hour. But Vijay and Sarah, if you don't mind going through and just answering all the questions, sure. then when I share yeah. the recording, uh, okay. individuals can watch to get their questions uh, answered. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. So I'll try to get going quickly. So I'm going to be deploying this eight fifty six. So I just want to complete the full picture. So I'm just putting comments. So now that, I mean, just while that flow is being deployed, so if you come to the B2B inbound application runtime logs, you will see that, so in, in the B2B world, you may have to get a bit, you, you may have a number of uh, endpoints from which you, are, uh, you have to bring files in. So every endpoint or every partner that you are adding, and when the deployment happened, so this app got redeployed. So uh, an instruction was sent to this app to start pulling this next gen uh, gadgets uh, SFTP location. So you see that every 30 seconds, you will see a log entry here. So we are also pulling files from other partner endpoints as well, uh, based on the frequency that was specified in the configurations. So here, uh, the next gen uh, endpoint is being pulled on a regular basis. So now I'm, uh, so this message flow is being deployed. And I'll just quickly complete the deployment of the A10 uh, invoice and then run some transactions live. Uh, so we can see all of these transactions going back and forth. Uh, <clears throat> while we're waiting, uh, Sarah, maybe if we can, if you can read the next set of questions. I yeah. 
keep going. Yeah, let's keep moving. There's, there's a bunch here. Um, are there, from Pranav, are there any views available where we can see the SSH keys expiry for all partners? Yeah, so there isn't a view that exists uh, inside of Partner Manager itself, but there is an API endpoint that you can call, like maybe on a regular basis, uh, that gives uh, the list of all the certificates, keys, which partner ID it is associated with, and the expiration date. So it, it could be a simple Mule application that calls that API every morning and then filters that using a data view to, depending on some customers have preferences to be alerted three months in advance or one month in advance. So you can build that uh, using uh, using that, using an API endpoint. Cool. Question from Kevin. Um, is a base MuleSoft <clears throat> license needed for partner manager deployment? Does the customer have to already be a MuleSoft customer? Yes, they, they have to be. A, it's not a standalone product. So if you're a new customer, so we do have a lot of uh, quite a number of uh, new customers that started their uh, journey with the AnyPoint platform directly on partner manager. But then like you need to still have the base subscription because as we see here, so all these applications get deployed in, in the customer's runtime environment, right? You still have to log into AnyPoint platform. And uh, under the covers, we also use AnyPoint MQ as a middleware layer uh, to process these messages. So yeah, it, it, it is an extension or add-on, but it, it can also be your uh, entry point into the AnyPoint platform with base plus partner manager as, as your um, uh, licensed uh, products. All right. Um, question from Vera: How do we how do we do code promotion to higher environments? Great question. So, <clears throat> so we, there is no out of the box way in which you can promote. So there are two aspects, right? So you have the runtime applications, right? All these applications that just got deployed, and then there is a configuration element. So let me ask a question here, right? So right now we are like this is let's say we are in test environment and, and maybe this instead of prod it we are delivering the data the translated data to test and this endpoint uses an ssh key and uh, more than likely this customer is going to have a different ssh key for their test environment and production environment so technically you are not able to just promote this flow that you are seeing in this screen to from one environment to another otherwise we are going to be starting to send production invoices to their test environment, right? So in a typical Mule CACD process, where let's say you have a general Mule application that is connecting to Salesforce, and maybe it's connecting to a, a MySQL database, you externalize a lot of those environment, environment specific properties like your uh, uh, URLs, credentials, your uh, paths and such things like through property files, right? So your CACD process is designed to take those environment, the, the, the configuration that change from between test to production or test to stage. Um, so in the B2B world, you have a ton of it in uh, things that change from environment to environment, right? Including the endpoints, including the certificates, including the identifiers, uh, including a number of things. So there is no like you, you cannot take the the uh, particular flow or a configuration from test and move it to production. So if I go to this 850 map, 850 flow example, so if I promote this from test to production, I'm going to call the uh, process API in the test environment. So, but on the other hand, Partner Manager automatically takes care of building these applications and deploying them. So. If you were to compare a typical CACD pipeline of how you build Mule applications and deploy them into uh, your runtime targets, where you externalize your environment specific properties in a external uh, CACD tooling. So you should think of Partner Manager UI as the place where you manage those environment specific configurations, where the products, like when you click the deploy button, the actual runtime code that goes into the runtime target is automatically built by us right so so that's i i, I thought I, I think that helped um understand uh how where where uh, how this is done 
you can also leverage some of the platform APIs to create those configurations. So again, but but still you have to maintain those uh, environment specific uh, configurations like your keys and the URLs and the passwords and the client credentials, et cetera, in a separate place. So I, I think that, I, I hope that was a helpful answer, even though it was too long. It helps. <clears throat> It helps so, uh, yeah, just uh, now I think all of these flows are deployed, right? So we have this um, 850, which is the purchase order, 850 UX, shipment, and invoice. So what I'm going to do is I do have, uh, I'm going to pick up this uh, file, which is an EDA file. So let me change the PO number to um, like maybe meetup. Meetup. One, two, three is my order number. So this is like for those that are not familiar with EDI, if you, if you yeah, in case. So this is basically just, um, it looks like it, it's more of a B-related file with some uh, standard specification. So each of these lines represent a segment and uh, this segment in a, so this basically tells it's an 850 purchase order coming from next gen going to mythical. And this meetup one, two, three is the PO number. And I have like, um, uh, four line items. So each of these PO1 loop is represents a line item. So I have this product called Mule Test 1. And let me change the quantity of that from 468 to let me order 3000 quantities of that product, right? So there are four items shipping to different uh, locations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, come to my FileZilla. I hope I get connected uh, to my SFTP. So I'm going to be dragging and dropping this 850 transaction. So this is base, oops, I think I have it in the wrong folder. Uh, so I was supposed to drop in the two mythical because it's coming from next gen going to mythical. So I just dropped it here. So this file should get uh, picked up uh, anytime by uh, our uh, uh, inbound SFTP application. So this is running every 30 seconds. So it's going to be picked up uh, momentarily. And then it, it's basically going to be uh, sent through the process. So I see, so next gen, so there is one file processed in the latest run of this. So what that means is this file should be gone from here. So it's already gone. And uh, if I go to partner manager and go to the transaction activity, uh, it is, uh, Probably still being processed. I go to the transmission. So, uh, okay. So it's being processed, and I think all these outbound transactions are also getting generated. Uh, so, 1009 is when I drop this meetup onto three order. So, you're able to see that file coming in. So, you are able to go inside of this transaction. You can see the EDA file that came in, or uh, you can see the translated JSON that was sent out uh, to the process API. And uh, I go here to my Slack and I see that at um, pretty much instantaneously after I drop the file, I see a uh, um, notification saying that this order, we change this quantity to 3000 and it, it has already created an SAP. So let me go and log into SAP and uh, we should see that order with that uh, those, uh, uh, those, where is that? So we should see the order showing up here, uh, successfully created. So all of this happens like pretty much real time, like just after I drop the file in the SFTP location. Um, and you're also actually, when you send these notification, you can also kind of um, construct a new URL that takes the users directly to the message if they want to look at something to make sure there is isn't any issue. Um, the next thing that I wanted to actually show is so you are also able to search for a particular order number or invoice number using the custom attribute search. So now we have a lot of these uh, different transactions. So I want to search for all transactions related to a particular order number. So I search and I get to see all of these 850s, 855, 6, 8, 10s. So I can go into 810. So when we define the invoice message type, so we, we were able to actually set these different attributes. So I can search by invoice number or PO number or sales order number or, or literally anything that uh, we configure. And uh, one last thing uh, before we uh, wrap up, 
uh, is the ability to uh, trace the transactions end to end, right? You have transmission ID. So anytime you process a transaction through Porter Manager, you uh, get a unique transmission ID, uh, which you can take uh, and go to any point monitoring because these transactions, some of this happens in that inbound SFTP application, and then there is a document processing application, and then uh, the process system API. So an order or an invoice or any B2B transaction for that matter goes through uh, a number of mule applications, right? Uh, in a multi-step fashion. So you search for the transmission ID. So here at 1009, this inbound SFTP application picked up that file from the customer. And then it basically was processed through the transformation logics in Partner Manager. And it was it uh, was sent to the SAP uh, process, so the process API, and then uh, eventually the SAP system API to create that order. So you're able to basically trace the transaction end to end. Uh, one last thing is um, like you will see that uh, for the outbound transactions where we configured the acknowledgments uh, expected you'll see that the transactions are set with the acknowledgement status as pending. So let me pick up this A10. Uh, and uh, so the control number for this A10 is four. So what I can do is I'm just going to kind of mock up a, a, a functional acknowledgement. So this basically I'm going to drop this acknowledgement file in the same folder in which the A50 was sent. So this is basically saying that, hey, I got this invoice with this control number four and I accept that transaction. So when we do that, we will uh, see the uh, we will see the status of that outbound 850, sorry 810, to get updated to an accepted status. So I drop this 9 and 7. So right now, uh, this is in a waiting for acknowledgement state. And when that acknowledgement um, file gets picked up and processed, we will see this uh, the acknowledgement status of this changing to uh, changing to accepted. Or it can also be rejected if uh, the 997 says it's rejected. Or if we don't get that acknowledgement within that two hours or 24 hours or whatever we configure in the message flow, uh, this will change to an overdue status. And when it, when it does, you're able to actually filter the transactions by overdue status. And again, like you can uh, build an a, a mule application to call an API to get these things. So for example, these transactions were sent out with the X, uh, but we haven't received a nine and seven back from this customer uh, past the due overdue time period that was specified. Um, so let's now see here. Uh, so there is, um, so we got this, the A10, the status of the A10 is now changed to accepted because uh, we had the nine and seven file that I placed in the SFTP location coming in. And this resulted in this transaction to be set to accepted. So I haven't sent a 9 and 7 for the 855 yet, and which is why it is still showing in the pending status. Um, I think that was all I had. I know it took a bit of uh, overtime, but I hope uh, everyone found it useful. So I'll stop sharing. And, and Sabrina and, uh, and Sarah, I think we can uh, take any uh, other open questions and maybe follow up through email or uh, uh, other uh, other means. Okay, great. Um, I think we still had a few. Uh, one I will just give a call out to is Vera, I know you're having issues with your developer trial. Um, I'm going to send your screenshots over to Vijayan to see if we can take that offline just because I think it might need some additional help. Um, and then for the others whose questions were not answered, I will take a screenshot, send them over to Vijayan, and we will make sure that we follow up. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all so 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 much uh for this awesome session thank you to our wonderful speakers that was amazing so much content um i will be sharing the recording likely tomorrow back on this meetup uh as well as sending it out to everyone who was unable to attend live with us today uh and please 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 join us back on april 4th at 9 a.m pacific time for another fantastic session thank you all so much thank you